Welcome back, students. All right, so yesterday you spent time previewing this article called The Golden Age of Athens. And on a Padlet, you made some predictions about what you thought the text might be about. So today we are going to read it and annotate it. Um, in this video, I'm going to read about half of it and annotate it. And then you are going to annotate the other half in the Nearpod. And then at the end, we're going to revisit the predictions that you made in the Padlet um, yesterday. And you are going to see, all right, like how accurate was I? Was I close? Was I not? Etc. So that's where we're headed today. Um, as we are reading this article, um, remember that we are, um, you know, we've been adding on what we're looking for as we read. So first we started out with the notice and note signposts. Um, and remember those are the contrasts or the contradictions to the absolute or extreme language, three word gaps, four numbers and statistics, five quoted words, and six repeated words. So we're gonna be looking for those, which we've been doing really well practicing that. But this time we are also adding in the big ideas and details um, of the depth and complexity icons. You'll remember that the big idea is represented by that um, tree or also by this um, Parthenon structure um, symbol that um, they use for an icon. And then the details is that smaller portion, which is either the leaf of the tree or the daisy, whichever one you prefer. And we've also started looking at text structure. Um, and largely, we've been using that to make predictions. So I'm going to um, before I start reading, I always like to scan what I'm about to read just so I get an idea of what's coming and then I'm not surprised. Um, I also just like knowing how long an article is uh, before I start reading um, so that I can like, mentally prepare myself for it. So that's what I'm going to do now. So here we have our title, Golden Age of Athens. Um, and then it looks like there is a description. This might be about the author or some background information that they thought we might need to know before we read. Okay, we have a picture, which is what I think of when I think of Greece. And it looks like it's divided into little tiny sections. So my guess is, is like, since the title is called The Golden Age of Athens, and it's divided into these sections, I think it's gonna tell us about different parts of all of like during this successful time that Greece saw. All right, so it looks like the article itself is about three pages. There are some questions after it, but we're not gonna worry about those. All right, so the big idea that we've been working with um, throughout these past couple days is that ancient Greece had a lasting impact on Western society. So we're gonna keep that in mind as we read, and we're gonna look for little details that support it as well as our notice and note signposts. So, Golden Age of Athens. The Golden Age of Athens, also known as the Age of Pericles, began in 478 BCE when the Athenians defeated the invasion, invading Persians. A Golden Age, this is probably going to be important since that's in the title, a Golden Age is marked by political, economic, and cultural growth. In this text, the author discusses the Athenian government during the Golden Age of Athens. So it looks like our focus is going to be on the Athenian government. It's always good to mark the topic. As you read, take notes on how the Athenians structured their democratic society. So um, like I've said in the past, you always want to know your purpose for reading and here the article gives it to us. It's saying this is the important um, angle that you should be looking for, how the Athenians structured their society. All right, first paragraph. The year was 430 BCE and Pericles stood ready to deliver the funeral oration honoring those who had died in the first year of the Peloponnesian War. All right, I'm going to pause right here. Um, oration. Uh, this might be a word gap. Um, it looks, if you look at it, um, kind of like the word oral, so meaning speaking. 
So it looks like he's going to give this funeral speech. And he's doing it to honor those who died in the war. It was an Athenian practice to honor war dead every year. And as custom dictated, the Athenians chose a leading citizen to de deliver the speech. According to the historian uh, Thucydides, who may have been present at the event, Pericles had as much to say about the greatness of Athens as he did about the heroism of its soldiers. So it's setting us up for some quoted words here. And it tells us that the quote is going to be either about the greatness of Athens or about the heroism. So quoted words. We do not use a constitution that copies the laws of our neighbors, but we are a pattern for certain people rather than imitating others. We alone do not think that a man who avoids public affairs is minding his own business. Instead, we call him useless. In short, I say that this entire city is the school of Halas. So here he's just saying like, you know, I, we are the ones setting the precedent. We're not copying what others do in their government. Um, we, we are the ones establishing it, which does tie back to um, how they structure their democratic society. And I could also say that I feel like this is a detail that supports their big ideas. So I'm going to draw a little leaf here. We'll pretend that's a leaf. Um, because our big idea is that ancient Greece had a lasting impact on society. And here it's alluding to the fact that, hey, we were the ones that established how um, our society worked, how our constitution worked. Rise of hoi polloi. So this is a word gap. Um, so sometimes what I like to do, especially since I, I mean, I could read further to understand um, what that is. Um, but, you know, unlike the word oration where I could kind of connect it to another word, I, there's nothing that's coming to mind when I see this. So sometimes while I'm reading, I like to um, Google a word. And so when I bring it up, it says that um, it refers to the masses or common people. So, let's see if. All right, so the rise of the common people. To understand how Athens became the school of Halas, we must look back 50 years to 480 BCE. It was in that year that the Greeks fought the invading Persians at Salamis and won a great naval victory. The Athenians had made the decision earlier to desert Athens and put their trust in the wooden walls of their ships. Their navy consisted of triremes, uh, tri vessels that had three banks of oars and required a highly skilled crew. So here's a word gap for me, and it gives us the definition right afterwards. So it consisted of these ships that um, were very difficult to manage. Unlike the cavalry or the infantry where you had to be wealthy enough to pay for your own equipment, just about anyone could join the crew of a trirumi. So it can be said that for the first time in Greek history, hoi polloi or the majority of the people were important. All right, so like I had said, if I had just kept reading, I could have found it out. Um, but I do think it made more sense to know that it was common people before um, I kept reading. So I was glad that I looked that up. All right, our, let's go to the next page. After the Athenian victory, the Spartans retreated into self-imposed isolation in their city-state to the south. The Athenians, meanwhile, formed a loose coalition called the Delian League. 
The Athenians also collected funds from the city-states that joined the League. The organization's stated purpose, I always um, mark it when someone something says that it's the purpose of something else, because I it's usually important. The organization's stated purpose was to finance a naval force capable of repelling Persian advances in the future. So at the beginning, you'll remember that it said in the little blurb that the golden age of Athens was marked by um, the Athenians defeating the Persians and a lot of the political and social and economic growth that came after that. Um, so right now, that this is what's important to them, um, is the fact that they have built this force that can um, withstand the um, invading Persians. But plans changed and the Athenians used the money to pay for the rebuilding of their Acropolis. Okay, we have a little footnote here. If I go down to the bottom, it says a protected high ground in Athens. That's what an Acropolis is. Among the structures involved in this product, project were the Parthenon, the Propylaea, and a huge gold and ivory statue of the goddess Athena Nike. Today, many of these structures still stand on the Acropolis, so that protected ground, eternal symbols of the glory that was Greece. So that's, that's why they consider this Parthenon um, so important is that it came out from this. Okay, this is the last section we're going to do together. Radical democracy. Right off the bat, I'm gonna mark the word radical as extreme language. Um, whenever we see the word radical, I, that always catches my eye. But it is in quotes, so I'm a little bit curious what, why the radical democracy is in quotes, what that means. Around 462 BCE, a radical member of the Democratic Party, an Athenian named Ephelates, succeeded in splitting the council of former leaders and defi dividing the authority among the bull or the council. So perhaps a word gap here, but it immediately defines it for us. And if we previewed the text, we're going to know that's important because it references it down here. So they succeeded in splitting the councils and dividing their authority among the um, bull. The ecclesia, or the assembly of the people, and the courts. This was the beginning of what modern scholars called a radical democracy because most offices and positions were filled by drawing lots rather than by a representative election. In theory, this meant that all Athenian citizens could have a direct voice in the day-to-day -day running of the government. So this is another detail that I want to mark here. So I'm going to mark it with a little semblance of a leaf. That one's a little better. Um, because their democracy, they split it up between a council, um, assembly of the people, and the courts. So if you think back to what you've learned in history class, you'll remember that um, the United States government is divided into these three branches. And so it's kind of a similar structure that we have um, that they established here um, in 462 BCE. So um, that's why I'm going to mark that as a detail because it supports our big idea that ancient Greece had a lasting impact on our society. In theory, this meant uh, that all Athenian citizens could have a direct voice in the day-to-day -day writings of the government. Um, I would also say that that idea very much prevails, the direct voice in our society, um, which, because you know we say, you know, vote, 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 and it's the fact that like you want your voice to be counted. Um, and, uh, I, and I think it's interesting that before this, they drew lots. Like, can you can you imagine like not wanting to be elected and they draw your name out of a hat and say it's you? Um, that sounds miserable. So, um, at least to me. So, that's the first half of the article. Um, we've found and identified some really good 
um, things within this. And uh, we've, it, it's been good to think through um, and voice what we are thinking about and processing as we're reading. Um, so I just want you to be super aware of that voice in your head as you're reading that's telling you, oh, slow down or wait or, okay, I know this, I can move ahead. Um, pay attention to that voice because it'll make your reading life easier. So now it is your turn in the next couple of slides to annotate for um, just like we were practicing the rest of the article. So you'll see that linked in the next couple of slides. Have a great day.